from with them. Um, OK. So welcome to the Community Engagement Forum's monthly coffee and chat session. Um, these sessions, they are, um, as many of you know, because many of you are returning visitors, which is great. Um, they're informal sessions um, um, where we in the Community Engagement Forum, um, we discuss different um, community engagement topics requested by the forum members. And um, today what we want to discuss is uh, something that's been requested by a few different people. Um, as we're all aware that when it comes to community engagement, um, the people on the ground, the local organizations, um, they are the ones um, with the, often the first responders, They're, they have the, um, a better understanding of the local context than the um, international organizations do. Um, they have a lot of experience and expertise that, that we want to learn from. And um, you know, in the community engagement forum, our ethos um, or purpose is to, to share with each other and learn from each other when it comes to community engagement. So today we've asked four different um, local organizations to join us and um, to basically tell us what we can learn from them. What can we do better? And when I say we, I speak as working for NRC, an international organization. Uh, what can international agencies learn from local NGOs when it comes to community engagement. Um, so we have um, uh, our contributors today are um, Dr. Timur Sharan. Um, he's the founder and currently serves as a chair of the board of Kadamat Development and Learning Organization, which is an Afghan NGO. Did I pronounce your name and, uh, and the name of the NGO correctly, Timur? It's Khedmat. Um... But that's fine. I'll I'll get into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Philip, if can you turn on your camera there, Philip, or um, and give us a wave. Uh, Philip John is head of programs for CCCM, so camp coordination and camp management, for Care Aid Support Initiative, which is a national Nigerian NGO. Um, he's currently based in Maiduguri in Nigeria. There's Philip. Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah, hi. Thanks hi, for Christian. joining us. Yeah, thank you. And we have, um, uh, oh, I see Janet is here now. Hello, Janet. Um, are you able to turn on your camera as well? Uh, Janet Ayo, she works for um, Narrative Hub, which is a South Sudanese women led national NGO uh, as executive director. If you cannot turn on your camera, will you? Unmute yourself, yourself and say hello. Janet. We'll give her a minute. Um, and our fourth contributor is uh, Yaksan Shishakli, um, who is the CEO of uh, Maram Foundation. It's a Turkish organization based in Gaziantep on the border to Syria. Um, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, the name is right. It's a Turkish Syrian NGO. Thank you, Turkish Syrian NGO. Perfect. So, um, um, I'll ask you first to, um, if all four of you um, can just give a very brief background um, and introduction to your organizations. Um, you know, just one minute. Um, what your NGO does, and um, uh, maybe specifically within community engagement. Um, so, Jackson, we can start with you. Yes, uh, uh, my own foundation, I founded my own foundation uh, in response to the Syria war or revolution at the time at the Syrian Turkish border. We were, we were the first or the second. So, basically, when we started, we had to do everything, everything meaning from Working in the camps, there was no camp. So establishing camp with no knowledge about any like structure to help women to give birth. So we basically did everything when we started. And that's what gave us some better experience than other agencies who came later with the community. And also because we mostly Syrian and Turks who lived in the border, who already have a relation across borders. So we that's how we started. 
Great, thanks and uh, well done. Um, Timur, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to meet all of you. I'm now based in, in the UK, um, exiled. Um, we set up Khetmat in 2015. A number of university professors came together. We were absolutely disillusioned by the university education uh, in Afghanistan um, at Kabul University. The best and the brightest of us, our generation would go to university, come up completely disillusioned, uh, depressed uh, by the professors, the education system and everything. So. It occurred to us that training the younger generation uh, at the university level was too late. So um, we set up Khedmat Development and Learning Organization. Khedmat means to serve, um, to train future leaders from disadvantaged uh, background. Um, now, this is a grassroots organization, youth led and voluntary. Um, it has over 250 members so far, half of them are girls. Uh, we have had until last year in the first five years of our operation, we never had, we never pursued donor funding. We had no intention of pursuing donor funding. And that was a strategic um, a decision on our part to ensure that we stick to the values that we believe in and, and embed our values uh, within the communities that we work rather than make them dependent on donor uh, funding. Uh, as I said, it's grassroots, youth-led, uh, and, and absolutely voluntary. Uh, and this year we are now training, we piloted a project in Afghanistan uh, last year to train 250 girls uh, in, at leadership, providing leadership and educational classes. This year we have now expanded that to 500 girls in two provinces in the Central Highland, Bamiyan and Daikundi. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Philip, do you want to introduce us to CareAid? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So, um, uh, basically, it's nothing new other than what uh, Timo said. CareAid is uh, basically a youth-led organization and uh, is a community-based and uh, it began uh, from the onset of the the Boko Haram insurgents in uh, Maiduguri, the, the northeast Nigeria. So uh, we had couples of interventions and shelter, NFI, watch CCCCM across the B state. So that is basically about care aid and how it emerged. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Janet, can you hear us and um, can yes. we hear you? Hi, welcome. Yes, Hello? yes we can hear you. Ah, finally. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been struggling to access. I have a poor internet. Hopefully, I will be, I'll be up to the last minute. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Janet Tayo. I work for Narrative Hub organization. Uh, Narrative Hub is a women-led organization. I'm the executive director for Narrative Hub. Um, we are doing introduction. Sorry. Yes. For can you introduce uh, just quickly what Narrative Hub does? Um, maybe specifically when it comes to engaging the community. Okay. Yeah. Narrative Hub. Uh, you, came to exist in 2016, uh, when the second conflict erupted in South Sudan, uh, whereby a group of women and girls were assaulted uh, sexually. And uh, of course, a few of them could access uh, services due to cultural and uh, uh, traditional and um, norms that uh, we associated with. Uh, so based on that, um, a group of uh, volunteers, women, volunteers to initiate narrative hubs so that we can come up with uh, proper ideas to empower women to actually um, uh, be listened to without uh, discrimination, whereby women voices can be heard whereby our voices can be considered 
where we can participate in the decision making because uh, we look at the, how customary laws are against the human rights and the women's rights. That's why we came up with the Narrative Hub. And uh, we have implemented uh, uh, protection pro uh, projects. We majorly implement gender-based violence with response to gender-based violence uh, in the country. And uh, we also uh, support children that are affected with conflicts. Um, also, we, we, we work with the IDPs in the CAM. We do CAM settings and CAM maintenance. I'm happy we are, I'm hearing some colleagues that are also working in the same sector. Uh, we also implement projects uh, to do with access to justice and the rule of law in the country uh, and um, mainly awareness on the reproductive health rights. This is basically what our uh, organization is doing and uh, advocacy for our policy change and assisting uh, in our traditions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Janet. Um, that's fantastic. Um, I mean, there, so there's a lot of similarities and a lot of differences between the four organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask, but uh, I'm also aware that the, the other participants probably came with a lot of questions as well for the contributors. Um, so I'll start out with one question, and then if anyone has any questions that they want to ask, um, just um, raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, so I want to start out by asking when it comes to uh, uh, emergency situations, so first response, um, um, uh, what, what is it that you can do as local organizations? And uh, what was the first thing that you do that, that you think that international agencies either cannot do or don't prioritize doing? Um, and uh, uh, why do you think this is important? So, um, um, any volunteers to start with this uh, question? I will jump. Uh, uh, let me, Kirsten. I mean, Please. as a local organization, I think we're more connected to the community, actually. I believe we're more connected to the community. So, first thing you usually we do, you can communicate with the community itself. So, we communicate between each other to check how to best response. And this is something that I will not, I, the UN agencies or international agencies, they don't have this luxury, if we call it luxury at that moment, to communicate. And because we're, we are part of the community, that give us not only access, better understanding with the actual immediate need or the dire need at the moment. Meanwhile, when somebody comes from outside, they have to do assessment to understand that what's happening, to assist, understand their community, to know who's who, and that takes some time. And that's what gives us more privilege to jump on the response faster. Yeah, excellent yes. point. Please, Janet. Let me come. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm talking to in the perspective of South Sudan. Um, when you look at the coverage of South Sudan, we are most uh, surrounded by River Nile. Uh, first of all, we, for you to access a project location, you must cross River Nile two or three times. So logistically, um, I, uh, implementation becomes very difficult. However, as a local organizations, we, we use, um, we cover a greater kilometers in terms of accessibility. And uh, we don't look at uh, what proper means to use. Uh, we have seen, uh, we have crossed rivers by road, by foot. We have used canoes uh, to reach to hard, hard to reach areas. There are so many locations that are hit to reach areas whereby international and UN agencies may not uh, access immediately uh, when emergency erupt. And also looking at the insecurity, uh, we, we don't 
check dwell much into you know uh, security clearance negotiating the the corridor the humanitarian corridors where it is accessible or it is not accessible like uh, how international and UN, UN agency does uh, we have seen where we just you know reach to the areas and we are the first the local organizations are the first partners to be on the ground and they are also the last uh, people to reach to to leave the, 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 the ground so I don't think these uh, international and UN agencies can do this as the local organizations actually give that to to the to the community. Thank you. Just to build on what Kovic said, um, in addition to access, um, I, I think what what makes um, grassroots organizations. Um, uh, important in, 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 in such situation is their ability to anticipate and identify strategic entry points that would take um, an international organization or uh, donor agencies uh, or the big players quite some time to uh, be able to identify those entry points. And because like in at Khidmat, we have sustained engagement. And again, I'm done with cliches of local ownership and engagement on others. I think we need to talk about sustained engagement, something that smaller grassroots organizations do on a daily basis. So just to take the example of Khidmat, for the past seven years, we have created a sustained engagement with the community that we work. We were the first entity in the Bamiyan province where I have come from uh, that we anticipated the arrival of the Taliban and made a decision to set up a community structure, a community shura, 21 member community shura, elected, selected by different communities across the province to play the role of bridge between the provincial administration and and the, and across the communities, and that 21 that makes it the difference between the province of Bamiyan versus our neighboring province in Daikundi, where we have struggling to negotiate access with the provincial administration. Whereas in Bamiyan, we were very quick to say, presenting the community themselves, look, these are our representative come to us if you want to understand the community. And that enabled us to negotiate access. And we are one of the few provinces in Afghanistan that are able to do uh, girls' education and girls' leadership training, uh, whereas others uh, are, are struggling in other parts of the country. So the key issue is sustaining that engagement, which donors don't do that because once the project ends, it ends. Uh, that investment is not there. And I think we need to shift the focus from, you know, simply in a discussion around community centric, centric approach to actually embed uh, uh, and invest in UN and other agencies sustained effort of doing advocacy work, community engage work, engagement work, and embed them throughout their entire operation, not simply along the project line so that they embed units that understand these communities well. Who are the key players? How do we nudge them? How do we change, uh, influence their structures and so forth? Thanks, Timur. There were excellent examples of um, uh, highlighting how community engagement can uh, be beneficial in sustained responses. Um, Philip, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, there are quite a lot uh, from our experience here in uh, Nigeria, most especially where all these uh, locations can't be accessed. Uh, practically, I'll give example because a uh, few years ago at the peak of the emergency, most of uh, our staffs volunteered to work for free. So one good thing is we work for free. And then with the network of our community-based staffs who volunteer to work, we source information and data from all those in inaccessible areas done uh, and then present it to the humanitarian community for planning and other stuff like that. So 
the UN agency have to, or other INGOs need to have to get uh, clearance and, uh, you know, follow protocols and, you know, procedures while uh, people are, you know, suffering and they need support. So for us, with our network of community-based volunteers, we get direct information. And secondly, as a local organization, we have a higher advantage because we are very close to the community. So it's most important because uh, most of these INGOs and then, uh, you know, they are just far, like a little bit distance from the community. But then we base in the community, we sleep, we wake up in the community. So this, uh, you know, helps us a lot in time of uh, uh, carrying out most of our implementation. And then uh, lastly, as a local actor here in my degree, we always work with the people to find solution to their problem, even without funds. So uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to see an INGO or even a UN agency, you know, bringing solutions. But then we are part of the community. So we suggest we prefer solutions to, you know, some of those problems, even without resources. So it gives a automatic uh, access for us to, to work and then uh, to do uh, and implement our projects. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philip. Um, this is all very inspirational. Um, uh, Kevin, um, I'm sure you have um, some um, um, some some burning questions. I don't know, but uh, maybe it's. I hope it's not too uh, spicy of a question, but I'm interested in it. So first, I have to say hello to Yaksan. So nice to see you on here, <laughs> and hello to Francesco. Also, long time since South Sudan. I was surprised to see both of you. Um, so. Yeah, this is a great topic. I think it's called what can international organizations learn when it comes from local organizations. So I'm going to get to my point. Uh, and the point is basically how sometimes local organizations are treated. We can say that way by the big actors, but it comes from my own experience. Partially uh, my last uh, posting was with, uh, in Gaziantep where I met Yaksan. And in Northwest Syria, the big actors at the time for 10 years couldn't do anything without local organizations, nothing, you know, no access basically. And yet I felt the attitude of many of my colleagues in different big organizations and whatnot was kind of like, well, these little organizations maybe don't know as much as us or they we're using them like extensions to do our projects instead of saying, hey, what can we really learn from you who are there? And it was just an attitude, not like terrible or negative, but it was certainly like maybe a hierarchy or something when in reality they were there and we weren't. And then, uh, Kristen, you know, I shared this uh, post on the forum with about the Ukrainian organizations. You know, when the Ukrainian crisis kicked off last year, I think it was like 100 or some Ukrainian local organizations published a letter to the international donor community and said, like, basically, hello, like, we have expertise. Are you going to listen to us? Are you going to simplify your bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera? So I guess my question for the four of you would be, yeah, what have you noticed and perhaps the way you are treated or the is there some sort of, um, yeah, preference for those who are international? Why do you think this is? And more importantly, do you feel that your benefits and your advantages as a local organization are recognized and used? by the donors, the UN agencies, the big NGOs. Um, yeah, but I, I feel I felt this a lot. So I'm curious to hear what you guys say from your perspective in the organization. Yeah, I don't know. Yaksan, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not spicy at all, <laughs> the question. Actually, it's everything. I mean, definitely, it's, a, it's really interesting. I mean, you're saying this because we work together in Gaziantep. Just, I mean, some agencies call the local NGOs as implementing partner. We're not even to the level to be a partner. And that's a big thing, even by naming the partner. Some people are changing it, but they're not changing the attitude. So basically, we are the subcontractor of doing the business. And yes, we have the forum where we can speak now and people, we do the meetings and it sounds sexy to be a local NGO. But when in reality, it's, they say, we have this project, you implement it. We were like, no, no, this doesn't work. It's like, oh, oh, this is how it works. And this is, I think it, it's coming from, yes, um, INGOs, they have, uh, I would say, better compliance system than local NGOs. When we started, I did not know what compliance is for NGOs. 
of course, I work in the States, I, I had the privilege, but as a compliance, I was like, no, we give the thing and we leave. Why do we have to ask questions? And even the people on the ground, they hate us when we go again and again and ask and check. And so we were like, we don't need this, but international agencies, they were like, no, you need this. At the same time, they overdo it where people on the ground hate us for doing it. Also, one of the other things, when they announce the funding, the local community, uh, they put us at risk as a local NGO. So one of the things, the INGO is a new agency, trans, especially in uh, Northwest Syria, they transfer the risk to the local NGOs. And when they announce the big amount of funding, they say we have for Syria. And it happened to me once, like they somebody announced $200 million for Syria, wherever camps. And then all the camps were protesting and they like, would like wanna beat us, where's the money? So they not really, yes, they're doing their job the right way pro probably for Geneva or Brussels or some, or DC, but they not really understanding how we face the locals. And we are like, we are in the risk taker and they give us more risk to take and that to create, make our life harder. I will stop here and have like my colleagues to, should they have things to add? If I go, if I could go next, uh, that's a great question, and I let me tackle it. Uh, uh, is that it might, might be my phone? Sorry. Let me tackle it by um, through three levels. The first is the discourse and the narrative of development aid itself, which is racist. Now that I've come and lived in the UK, I realize how incredibly why dominated that field is in itself. Um, and it's 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 absolutely fundamentally top down, the narrative itself, the discourse around development and so forth, that produces this um this this um this lack of diversity and inability to generate the voice of the global south, if that's the right term, or developing countries to come through. So, and I had I had this discussion with Syrians. Uh, there was an exchange between Afghans and Syrians. It's just incredible. The same way that Ukrainians are now talking about this whole thing. So there is a fundamental problem at the structural level as the narrative level. Second is at the sort of implementation level where at the national level, where you, what you get is donors, international agencies, national agencies like in Afghanistan that are operating from the days of Peshawar, completely fattened, corrupt, often manufactured by the international N NGOs and so forth. So you get that level. And that level is urban-led, very narrow, urban-led, um, uh, who often elitist in their own country, the, the, the local people, and look down at the rural population that we often end up working with. So then you get this attitude of people working for UN, and then let me give you an, an example of Afghanistan. The UN agency in Afghanistan was completely captured by three provinces in eastern part of Afghanistan. Around 90% of the, the staff came only from three provinces out of the 34 provinces. And that you see everywhere. So, and then among them, it was just the elite Peshawar, Pakistan educated individuals who had barely any connection with Afghanistan. So that's the top down hierarchy that you're talking about reinforce it itself. And then what it produces, it doesn't appreciate local knowledge. It doesn't appreciate uh, communities. And at the local level, what happens, and again, this is something we have desperately tried to avoid, is we don't want to create duplicate what's happening at the national level by creating a charity organization that are well educated, then look at the communities and say, well, you don't understand what's going on. Yeah. So for us, it's important that the communities are in, in embedded in programming. So not only that, we create a specifically a position around advocacy. We get we, we get that person from the community, regardless of level of education and so forth. And that person is embedded throughout the program itself. And right now we are recruiting three girl, three women to from the communities uh, that will come and simply advise 
the management of uh, the, the operation itself. So I think uh, those are the key issues. Now, you talked about risk. What happens is, again, in relation to Afghanistan, it's a sanctioned country. Who takes the risk? The risk gets, um, what's the right word, directed and subcontracted all the way to the locals. The donors are not taking risk right now. Uh, in relation to Afghanistan, they're saying, well, we have the money. If you want to implement, this is it. And we, what they do, they increase compliance. So it makes it very difficult for the national organizations to imp implement. What the national organizations then do is then they're not honest. They're not honest to say, well, there is aid uh, diversion, there is aid corruption, there is this and that. Because, because the donors have set up this, this incredibly difficult a uh, compliance system that that the nationals are overlooking at it, you know. So that then trickles the risk all the way to organizations like us, if we are donor dependent, which we do not want to be donor dependent for that very reason, because it it distances us from the communities that we try to do, and because of the level of accountability that is upward rather than downward or balanced, what we we don't want to end up not being honest to the community and ourselves that actually aid harms people here you know and this is we see in, all the time in afghanistan right now let me stop there sorry about this round thanks very much timur um, um philip or janet do you want to add anything from um, your experience Yes, let me copy. Hi, Janet. Thank you so much. I just want to add on that point this way. Um, in South Sudan, we have a number of uh, women-led organizations and other local partners that are also responding into emergencies. But um, what we have seen is the, the, the UN agencies and the uh, international organization do not trust a uh, local organization in when it comes to information sharing. We have interagency need assessment that is always conducted whenever there is um, uh, emergencies, but in case this uh, assessment is done by local organization partners, uh, it will be looked at like as authentic uh, reports that cannot seek uh, funding. So, in other words, the, the international organization and the national organization will re will reschedule for meet for assessment, despite having uh, assessment report. This is, you know, what local organizations are facing in South Sudan. Um, also, you know, local organizations are given less, less funding to access, I mean, to, you know, cover a greater uh, coverage with the response. Uh, but when you, you know, this is what um, uh, inter international organization cannot, you know, commit to because they will have a lot of, you know, lines, they look at uh, overhead, they look at, you know, but you see where international and local organizations are dictated on what to take or not to take, you see. This is what we are facing uh, in South Sudan. This is what I can add. Thank you. Thanks very much for that um, um, perspective, Janet. And um, Philip, do you want to add anything from Nigeria? If, um, yes, um, uh, quite thank you for Timo because it's like he has practically been in Nigeria even without his presence here, you know, um, saying a lot about uh, things that are happening, but uh, making emphasis on the, the RICs, uh, the local organizations, you know, take the higher RICs, but when it comes to funding, the UN agency, INGO, takes the bigger envelope and then allocation of, you know, the little funding for them to cover wide, you know, locations. Uh, often what happened here but yeah the un agencies and uh, the ingos do trust to some extent the local partners to to actually work for free and and then source out the informations and feed them back with however uh 
with the coming of forums like this, uh, we try to push and see how uh, local NGOs, including the government strategy for uh, community-based organizations to access funding so that they can really do the work very well with the support of resources. So uh, this is practically what is happening, but all what colleagues said are basically what uh, is happening all around. Thank you. And also what I've seen in South Sudan, the most um, experienced uh, staff are being poached by international organizations. You see, uh, then they keep on saying, you know, local organizations do not have capacity. And when, when of course, sometimes some of them may not have capacity, but of course capacity is built based on, you know, uh, partnership, you know, collaboration. And if you build uh, the capacity of a certain organization, and then, you know, you pick, uh, you keep picking on, uh, you know, the experienced uh, staff. What is the use of, you know, building the capacity? You see. Yeah, excellent point. Thanks, Janet. Um, Emmy, do you have a question for? for our panelists here. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you so much for all coming and being with us today. And I hope you can join our next meetings as well, because it, it has been definitely super interesting to hear from you all. And thanks a lot, Kristen, for organizing it, of course. Um, so my question is about our very fancy word, um, coordination. Uh, I am from Turkey and this year, when earthquake happened, I had a chance to work in my own country. Before that, I never had a chance. Um, and it has been specifically very interesting for me because right after the earthquake in Turkey, I started working with the local organizations. Um, and then after a while, I, I'm working with IAM. So I had an assignment and I started working with IAM. And, um, and specifically in coordination. Um, and um, of course, like the first responders and like at first everything has been done with by the local organizations here. And what I specifically appreciate is community engagement is not the purpose for local organizations. It's a mean, it's a facilitator, right? Like they don't do things to do community engagement, but it's their way of working, which I always really, really appreciate because it's very natural. It just happens. Um, but when the coordination happens, I like when the coordination started, I have seen a huge, huge gap between the obviously local organizations and UN agencies or international NGOs, um, even in, in terms of communication, right? Like we were not really able to bring local organizations to the sector meetings or involve them as much as we should. Um, and there are many barriers, obviously, like there's language barrier, but also I think like for some organizations that are really on the ground and doing very like practical work, coming to a sector meeting and discussing for three hours in English, just like doesn't mean much, right? Like they, they wanna be on the ground and doing stuff. Um, and obviously I have seen myself from both like with my Turkish identity, like that I can speak the language and like from with my sector identity. Um, so, what I'm really wondering is, like, I know it's a million do dollar question, but do you think is um, the coordination, like joint coordination is really possible or it's just not possible at all? Like we are just like trying to play a game, but it's never gonna work. Or do you think it's possible and what we need to do to achieve joint coordination? Thank you. This is a really good question, uh, Amy, and, and this is, I tell you, from the experience we had in Northwest Syria for when the cluster happened, you know, it's like the CCM cluster and other clusters. It took us a lot of time. It's a long journey to fight to be in the cluster head. I mean, we managed one or two clusters or to be co-leading co some of the clusters, but it's not easy. The agencies will not let this uh, happen easily because again for too many reasons but one of the reasons they think they are better in coordination than the locals or they can have better access in coordination 
And this is something, I mean, we're talking in Syria 11 years. And uh, by the way, I was in the earthquake and I was in Gaziantep and I traveled to Hatay and all other areas. And I, I've been, I've seen the misunderstanding and coordination happens between the local NGOs and INGOs. And it's still happening, by the way, big time. And it's not getting together. And, and it's not the language because the language, of course, is a barrier, but there's always a way to communicate. But coming with superiority, when we think, from both side, by the way, local NGO thinks we're much better because we work on the ground and the uh, international agency, including UN, they think they're much better because they have deeper, uh, deeper pocket, they have the money, and also they have more different system. So we clash in many, many bases, and coordination will happen only when such a form like the form we're speaking right now, while other forms uh, uh, have the initiatives to communicate in a better way. And that's what I think. Janet, Timor, Philip, any wisdom to share here? How to how to solve the coordination problem? <laughs> it's one of those problems, isn't it? It's those um, collective action problem. <laughs> I remember when I was doing my master's, I was one of the key, um, you know, dilemmas, how do you resolve it? Um, and again, historical evidence seems to suggest that we are terrible at it. Um, you know, it it was impossible in Afghanistan to coordinate um, across the UN agencies, beyond the UN agencies with locals. Um, and part of it is to do with the mentality, the existing mentality. Um, how, given how aid and development is structured globally, everyone is so protective of their own tiny little part that they struggle to share. And I'm guilty of it myself because I've worked in the development sector um, of sharing information, um, you know, moving beyond, you know, uh, getting who gets what credit. Um, and that needs to change. And now that I'm in uh, doing this academic thing, I'm realizing how academics are awful when it comes to collaboration and coordination, you know. Uh, and it goes back to mentality. Uh, it, it's just that mentality, the culture that exists that doesn't allow doing, uh, moving beyond the selfless. Because if you want to coordinate, you need to, you, need, you can't be selfish. You need to be selfless. You need to, uh, um, uh, and again, we all came to development to do good, and and often we forget uh, the what we are supposed supposed to do. But maybe one thing that I want to say is, and again, beyond the question of you know engaging communities, giving them power, and and all the rest of it, I think we need to give more space. To communities to struggle, maybe to get it wrong, maybe um, and be OK with communities getting it wrong in terms of the delivery of aid, in terms of distribution of it, management, management of it so that they learn. In another word, I'm trying to say we need to give space to communities to to learn best practices, to come up with best practices and enlighten us how to do things differently. And that needs to come up a combination of a bottom up approach through lots of mistakes and a top down approach. And the top down approach needs to, uh, we uh, at the national level, international level, we need to do really well by maybe now in 21st century using technology. And, I, it, and it's just one area when it comes to coordination. I'm just incredibly amazed how little technology we use. The use of app, the use of other means, platforms to coordinate. It's just unbelievable that that hasn't happened after a trillion dollars spending in Afghanistan. There's not a single app that could connect, you know, the donors among each other. And it just says a lot about how how this is uh, this this challenge remains as as an issue. Thanks very much, Timur. Um, and. Sorry, I'm looking at the time and um, 
I'm conscious of um, Emmy's point about um, um, coordination meetings, three hour long coordination meetings where we just pontificate and uh, uh, there's no actual action points. So I want this to get in. This is much more interesting than a coordination <laughs> meeting. Don't worry. Most definitely. <laughs> However, um, uh, there might be time for more questions after this, but I, I really want to ask um, all the contributors now to um, to now that they have the chance, we have UN agencies, we have international organizations here, we can share this recording with donors. Um, uh, what would you like us to do differently from now on um, um, to better work with local organizations, to better work with local communities when it comes to community engagement? Um, well, so, Jackson, you can thing. start. Yeah. Yeah, if you're sharing this one with donors, I would first of all I say thank you, every donor. We love you. We, we have no problem. <laughs> uh, actually, what's what's really donor and international agencies mixing? Hiring locals doesn't mean localization, and we've seen this a lot. Like they hire, like Taimo mentioned, they hire people, then they hire people from the same area. They think they know, understand the culture. No, because sometimes locals with the good intention, they drive the interest of the NGO to different level, to certain areas where it doesn't represent the need of the society and the community. So basically, and they, I've seen this a lot. They will be like, no, this guy is uh, from this, uh, from the country, from the local, from the community, and he understands. And I'll be like, yes, we love the guy, but he doesn't, <laughs> you know? And, and doesn't represent what we really need as a community. And this is happening, it's been happening a lot. They built a trust around one or two people within the organization. Uh, and it's like, the guy knows, we trust the guy, he's been with us five years, he works with us in this country and that country, he knows. No, he doesn't. Then he lead the organization response for something. And after two years, they will be like, whoops, the guy did not know. And this two years, by the way, means a lot for the local community, especially in the response. It's, it's mean future. Missing distribution of a food basket for a family, it means the kids will not go to the school. That's mean the future of the society. So I think what we really need to go to ground ground level more and not just to have uh, just communicating with few locals make us believe that we localized. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jackson. That's excellent practical advice. Um, Janet, are you there? Will you share? Oh, Philip, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, one good word from Yaxan, he said hiring the local doesn't mean localization. It's, it's very, very important uh, because if we are looking at uh, sustainability, actually there has to be some strategies put in place for for us to achieve and then to have a maximum you know, continuity of our activities. So. Uh, what I expect to see is uh, strong collaborations with locals or community-based organizations with uh, the UN agencies and um, the INGOs. I think this will help a long way in time of uh, sustainability. If this UNA is not here, uh, probably this local NGO can sustain the activity and see how it uh, responds even with little resources or so. So I think this a lot might help. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Janet. Yes, actually, I just want to supplement what uh, Philip said. Uh, the, co the, the collaboration that uh, I would emphasize is um, you should have a mutual understanding, a mutual respect, and a spirit of uh, localization of, uh, for, of interventions. Uh, where we can learn from each other, not uh, bringing issues of uh, you know our differences and the capacity, and also you know the scarce resources we have available, it should be you know shared among the uh, the humanitarian agencies equally. Actually, this is what I can add. Thank you. Maybe the last word. Um, I have been incredibly um, fascinated recently by behavioral insights. 
and I've read a lot about recently about nudge theory and all the rest of it. And when I when I set up this Afghan call, something called Afghanistan Policy Lab, our intention was to do to use behavioral insight methodologies and and do a lot of pilot studies. I do think international communities in development does not do enough piloting. Um, piloting in a sense to pilot to see to understand what works, what doesn't work before you commit to a multi-billion dollar project. And I think and then the under road after a midterm evaluation, they realized they got it wrong. So I think that's it, it's important to to be able to use some of these recent tools that has emerged in economics and other fields in development area and do better behavioral insights and embed the use of behavioral insight in development uh, doing development work. And with that, that means doing a lot of piloting understanding what works and what doesn't work. And by doing that, you're essentially giving a voice to local communities because you are then able to identify some of the best practices that are emerging from the local population and able to scale it up. Thanks very much. Um, um, I do really, really like uh, practical advice. And um, so this is Brilliant. Um, uh, I saw another hand, and I think we might have time for one more question for those who are able to stay on. Uh, we're coming up towards the hour. I don't remember who had their hand raised. Or if anyone has a, a, a new question. Oh, Lana, was it you? Yes, there you are. We can't hear you. Yeah. Try again. Wait. Oh, I was just no, I, I think there's an echo. Sorry, we can't hear what you're saying. Is it the question in the chat? No, we can't. Um. Is it about what tips would you give for better coordination beyond meetings? That's a good question. Let's be for less coordination meetings. <laughs> less coordination. What's because the alternative? Honestly, <laughs> honestly, they do like what we usually spend a lot of forces and time to have like 20 coordination meetings for the response where you have to attend all and then you don't have people to do the job. I mean, uh, bigger agencies where they have specialized people who can attend those meetings. Yeah. I know this answer, you, Nana, in a way. Uh, My only suggestion to that would be uh, maybe we need, we could do, and again, this is happening, but it's not happening uh, enough mobile units um, at the community level. So, you you bring coordination closer to the communities that are impacted. Um, and then again, if I as a, as a former ant anthropologist, I I'm very keen that practitioners need to embed themselves in, in communities just during that period of crisis. If if the leadership can embed themselves for a day or two in those communities to get a better sense of what's going on that significantly improves coordination because your staff need to see that the leadership is not in the ivory tower, but actually on the ground in the field. And that reduces a lot of meetings and so forth. And then everyone else would be mobilizing around that. So uh, yeah, my humble suggestion, again, that's something not, that I'm, I don't know much about. Christian, I guess Lana's first question was also very interesting. Like, I also would love to learn more about it. If if NGOs coordinate within themselves without UN or international organizations being present, like if you think that NGOs actually do coordination within themselves. Uh, 
Sure. <laughs> I mean, why not? Uh, uh, you really don't want the big players in uh, you know, in the room when you are uh, discussing, uh, yeah, when you're trying to code. And absolutely, I, I think that's important. In fact, not having the coming with one voice, one clear strategy and taking it to the UN and donors, you 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 take ownership of the process, the same way that Ukrainians were trying to do in Ukraine. A colleague gave an example of that, and I think that's important. You need to take ownership of the process, and then doing that internal coordination and ability to strategize, I think, is very very important, so that you can dictate. I do wonder, um, Janet, if you if uh, you're still here, and I'm aware we've gone above like over the hour. Um, our conversation, how that, um, how realistic this is for you as a women-led organization in South Sudan, um, accessing the coordination uh, mechanisms, both for, um, both for the organization that you work with and also just participation for women in general. I'm looking for Janet. Janet, there you are. Um, can hello. you hear us? Hi. Hello. Yes. yes. Hello. Yes. Please go ahead. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I I must appreciate the HCT uh for South Sudan, at least uh when um. Uh, localization agenda was introduced in um, late 2019, 2020, at least they started to pick up the agenda and look at how to, you know, uh, develop strategies on how to bring local organization, including um, women-led organization into leadership. Um, we have seen different clusters, uh, Watch clusters, NFI, GBB, they have also adopted the system whereby they identify uh, local partners in the states and um, including women-led women -led organization to take, to, to, to take coordination and leadership at the state level whereby uh, coordinations are done and reports are given to uh, the cluster coordination at the national level. And I think this, this has been it's working on well. Uh, the local organizations are, are, are having, you know, experience are building kind of um, coordination and leadership. Yeah, this is something that is working out in South Sudan very well. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, that uh, it's working and they found some ways to improve um, coordination with women-led organizations. Um, so um, um, before uh, thanking everyone and um, closing our session today, um, I want to remind you about our next session. So uh, we'll go back to our usual last Thursdays of the month. So our next session will be on the 26th, I was looking this up earlier, 26th of October. Um, and um, if I'm not wrong, Kevin, um, our colleagues from IOM will uh, share with us um, specifically on how to engage women and girls um, in displacement yep. responses. Yeah, our colleagues from the women's supplier. participation. Yeah, perfect. Um, I'll send out the invite and information about that as well. Um, that was just a reminder. Um, if anyone has any closing thoughts, um, any inspiring words, um, please don't be shy. Or they don't have to be inspiring. They can be a constructive criticism that we can take with us into our working day. I think committee should keep working because we will get there. I think we're getting there. I mean, this form, other forms, and this louder we speak. I mean, there is donors are listening, and I think we should keep going. That was inspiring. Thanks, Jackson. Anyone else? Oh, 
So my side, no, I'm rushing. My baby's crying. I have a baby of four months <laughs> that's been calling me. Let me rush. Thank you. Meet again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yaksan and Janet, Timor and Philip. Um, thanks, Thank everyone, you. for your good uh, questions and discussions. And um, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.